is recording. Great. Awesome. So, um, so this is going to be talking about diagnostic and therapeutic decisions and pulmonary embolism. Um, the objectives are how do we define massive pulmonary embolism versus not submissive, but <laughs> submassive and low risk PE. Um, when is thrombolysis beneficial? And what do you do with the patient with imminent mortality from PE? And who can you discharge home for PE? That kind of covers the entire spectrum of the disease. Uh, disclosures, I have none related to pulmonary embolism diagnos diagnostics or treatments. Um, so let's start off with the case. This is a patient in their 70s. Um, this is the pre-hospital note, noting the patient on chief complaint of chest pain. When EMS arrived, the patient was getting up off the bed and had a syncopal episode. He was on the phone with the nurse stating that he was having chest pain and a hard time breathing. Um, and after the fall is when 911 was initiated. On arrival, uh, patient uh, airway, breathing, circulation were all intact. Uh, he was cool and diaphoretic and pale and had a complaint of chest pain, difficulty breathing. After moving the patient, um, he became cool, diaphoretic and ashen and then pulseless and apneic. Uh, there were lung sounds that were clear prior to that and, um, and there wasn't any head, neck, back or abdominal pain. Um, he was, he was uh, initiated with, uh, with chest compressions and uh, they placed a nasopharyngeal airway and uh, placed pads on them and gave them bag valve masks um, on, during transport. Um, so he was lift, lifted onto a chair, buckled in, and uh, brought in code three with sirens um, and with report given to MICN just prior to arrival. Uh, when they arrived at the facility, um, he was moved to a gurney and then the report was given. Now, here's his initial vital signs. A blood pressure 92 over 60 with a heart rate of 122 and a respiratory rate of 24. His uh, respiratory rates were shallow, clear, um, and pulse ox was 86% on room air. Um, as soon as they began CPR, um, they uh, noted an initial end tidal CO2 that was fairly low at, uh, at 13. And um, this was all within just a few minutes of their arrival. So they, they'd gotten on scene and only been on scene for a few minutes when they arrested and then they transported pretty quickly. The, the transport distance from the hospital was just over uh, two miles. So it was a fairly short tran transfer period, which indicates why they, you know, they were trying to establish an IV and, and so on and so forth. There wasn't really a lot of other medications delivered in route or an attempt to intubate the patient um, in route because they were so close. Um, here's the code blue uh, record. Uh, this is the sheet for that uh, showing the patient you know, arrived um, at, and we initiated um, with giving an amp of epi. The initial rhythm was PEA and uh, we gave an amp of bicarb and within about three minutes of arrival we had return of spontaneous circulation. Um, the patient was, um, was very ill appearing, um, mottled, um, cool to touch. And, uh, and appeared very appeared very ill. The, one of the reasons why I wanted to share the code blue sheet was also to kind of reiterate a lesson of something that that we've been doing, which is trying to to develop decision support instruments to assist us during CPR. And so the record sheet itself is meant to put the per the nurse recorder into an important role of help of assisting with the differential diagnosis during during CPR. So you'll note here, the first two boxes are listed there to record the times and information, um, as well as what the rhythm and, and any, any initial treatments that can be given where you can just check the box or, or otherwise. But the, the next line after those two boxes is, is a note where the recorder is asked to, con is to continue CPR and then state out loud the reversal causes within three to five minutes of arrest. So that nobody's trying to remember the H's and T's, but we're actually systematically going through and discussing them within the first three minutes of arrest. And the reason that that's so important is to quickly allow us to develop an agenda for that patient and give consideration of hyperkalemia, hypoxia, hypothermia, and so on and so forth, and to give consideration of thrombosis, whether it's pulmonary or coronary, because we probably underutilize fibrinolytics during cardiac arrests. And when we do think of it, it's usually well into the arrest 
portion where they haven't responded and we're like, well, maybe it could be this. And then there's right. this clinical inertia to decide to use it or not because now it begins to pre approach a point where it seems futile to consider, right? And, yeah. and that's the hardest that's the hardest part of it. And so a goal from the Code Blue Committee was, well, let's let's develop an instrument where we empower the nurse who's recording to speak up for the team and say, let's early on, let's consider these and check these off and just say, yes, this was considered, this was considered, and so on and so forth as we're going through. And it doesn't mean that you're treating along every single one of those those points, but that there is a gestalt that's developed by the team managing that patient to help determine which of these may be more likely or not for that patient. And so we we got that. Here was his initial EKG. Um, the EKG is a uh, wide complex um, dysrhythmia. There's um, a nonspecific ventricular block uh, that's noted here. And there in the in uh, V1 and V2, um, there's quite a bit of discordance with the ST segments from their QRS complex. Um, this isn't specifically Scarbosa criteria because Scarbosa criteria is applied to a left bundle branch block pattern, but it certainly gave rise to the thought of once we had pulses back, could this be, since this was a witnessed arrest, and this was EMS witnessed arrest at that, um, could this be a uh, acute coronary syndrome? And so, um, out of uh, out of really a propensity of caution, we decided to activate an acute um, uh, cardiac alert and asked for the uh, the cardiologist to come downstairs uh, to see the patient. Initial labs uh, were here. The patient's uh, um, Potassium was normal, so again, wide complex dysrhythmia with a cardiac arrest. Obviously, hyperkalemia is on the is is of consideration, which is why we initially started with some bicarb too. Um, it, it wasn't the only reason to do the bicarb. Generally, you know, the first line of therapy for hyperkalemia is going to be calcium, but bicarb is given because there was a downtime in transport of the patient. So um, I typically like to like to lead with that early for that reason. The um, Patient CO2 was normal, creatinine was slightly elevated, and otherwise, uh, patient uh, had was um, had an increased uh, uh, hemoglobin and crit, and glucose was elevated as well. Uh, otherwise, the laboratory derangements really, really weren't that severe, excepting um, later when we noted that you know obviously we got the lactic acid back, and none of these came back exactly at the same time. Obviously, the lactic acid came back very high at 11.4. Uh, the white count was elevated at 22,000, and INR was normal. The, the uh, PTT is also elevated, and I'll explain why in just a moment. Uh, this is a blood gas that was obtained showing a uh, pH of 6.9 with a PCO2 of 76, um, by car sorry, PO2 of 103, and, um, and base excess of minus 17 with a low SAT. And you'll notice here FiO2 is 100% because this was obtained um, when the patient was intubated. So shortly following ROSC, so this is back to that, that brief period where we, where we were, um, we then again lost pulses. Uh, the patient was intubated, an orogastric tube was inserted. Um, we saw this wide complex dysrhythmia and getting intermittent ROSC actually uh, pretty quickly again and gave amiodarone um, there was uh, there was no sustained pulse, so then we went back in and uh, and gave additional epi, uh, still in a PA rhythm, um, with suspicion on the EKG that we obtained uh, was that uh, this could be ACS. It was given 4,000 units of heparin bolus, um, and then um, shortly right around this period, we initiated. Um, interposed abdominal compression CPR, so we're doing both chest compressions and abdominal compressions. Um, one, so chest compression followed by abdominal compression, followed by chest compression, and abdominal compression was meant to, is uh, performed to uh, to compress the aorta and the IVC. Uh, by compressing the aorta, you give a counterpulsation back upwards through the aorta, 
and so retrograde pulsation that increases coronary artery uh, blood flow uh, because that's when blood flow is occurring to the coronary arteries is as you're coming off the chest. So it's the it's the um, it's the change in thoracic pressure, but it's particularly the it's particularly the negative aspect of that change that improves uh, coronary blood, blood flow. And during that negative aspect, if a positive pressure for below is also added, it further augments and increases coronary artery blood flow. It also increases right, uh, right atrial return. So you increase volume return to the heart. So you're giving preload with that and improving coronary perfusion pressure. So when you do this, you actually see the patients become more pink. And when you feel their pulses, their pulses become far stronger when you're doing it as opposed to just chest only CPR. It's not feasible, well, for many times it has not been feasible in the pre-hospital setting because it takes three providers to do it. Um, it that's becoming an issue worthwhile to going back and looking at, again, now that they're using uh, mechanical devices for chest compression, because now you can do that with two providers. So if, since the device itself is doing chest compressions, then it can free the paramedic to do abdominal compressions, which are, which are less taxing. And, um, and you have a metronome of the device going off at a specific issue, so it's easier to time, because you're not trying to time two humans to each other to try to do compression and, and, and altered uh, abdominal compression with them in timing, but rather now you've got a metronome going, so you're just going in between the the pushes on the device. Anyway, um, so we were doing this and we were getting improved pulses and we were getting ROSC back again. And so we, we got pulses back. Um, at this point, we're about um, about 20 minutes in into the case and the cardiologist is at the bedside and is requesting an EKG during CPR. And it just wasn't feasible, but we were doing, a, I was doing an echo in between that time. And with the echo, you could see that the right uh, ventricle was severely dilated um, and hypokinetic. Uh, actually, there's severe global hypokinesis of the heart, but especially the right side of the heart really wasn't moving. There was what would be called a McConnell sign, where the entire right ventricular lateral wall is, is, isn't moving at all and just the apex of the heart is moving. And so it causes what's, and I'll show a video of this later, it causes what's called a trampoline sign on an echocardiogram, where it looks like the very tip of the right ventricle is bowing inward and upward like a trampoline would, while the rest of it holds still. And that's, that's, how, you, that's how you define the McConnell sign. Well, that's how you see it. Um, anyway, so in discussion with the, with the cardiologist, we both agreed this seeming less like acute coronary syndrome and a lot more like pulmonary embolism. So we gave uh, Tenecteplase uh, 50 milligrams push and uh, that delivered that delivered as a push over about uh, over a few seconds and a central line had been placed as well during uh, during this period so this was placed via the central line. Uh, following that um, we continued to uh, we started the patient on dopamine um, and then we got a we got a pulse back again, and now the pulse was back and was was sustained. Um, and at this time we re-echoed again, and again the echo showed severe right ventricular dysfunction with with a with a right ventricle that was considerably larger in diameter than the left ventricle. And the the patient continued to receive um, some uh, support. We um, put them on a rate of uh, 14 with a tidal volume of 500, um, 100% and a PEEP of five. Um, and in order to maintain sedation, um, this was worth noting was that during CPR, this patient was actually grabbing at us. So this was one of those chest compressions where the person's awake as you're doing the compressions and they're grabbing at you and then the second you stop chest compressions then they're gone. And so it was, a, it, it was difficult, and it was particularly difficult to get the central line in because the patient was moving so much. So um, the quality of the CPR was really good. <laughs> and and uh, these different techniques of, of interposed and whatnot were certainly helpful. Um, but we needed to also sedate this patient. 
Um, and so we were talking to him, and he was trying to reach up to grab his tube. There were, I mean, there were a lot of purposeful movements going on here. Um, not so much that he could follow commands, but we were we were aware that he was aware. And so we decided to use ketamine um, as a uh, sedative infusion um, since I needed something to increase vascular tone and not decrease it. And Versed and any fentanyl and anything else that I'm going to use uh, potentially is going to decrease vascular tone. Fentanyl less so, but still, still some. Um, whereas ketamine, we know is going to increase vascular tone. So um, that was the choice there for um, for initial sed initial sedation. We also added uh, uh, vasopressin as a uh, as a presser drip and uh, milrinone. Uh, milrinone was added because we knew that we had poor uh, contractility and we needed to increase inotropy, while at the same time trying to improve the um, improve the treatment of vascular resistance. And there's less effect of increased systemic vascular resistance with milrinone. It's an older drug, but most of us don't use it that often anymore. But in that moment, we were trying to think, what can we do that will give us squeeze and at the same time allow us to potentially improve flow through the pulmonary artery and milrinone was a was a reasonable drug to consider and, and pharmacy was great. It was it was right because the last time I've I've titrated milrinone was in residency and anyway. Um, so that was kind of the decision making that was going on there. Um, I think important to mention is that this is not necessarily held up as an example of how to do the resuscitation. Just this is what the resuscitation was, and so I don't want to give um, I don't want to give a false impression about about that. You'll you'll notice there's several sheets of of code blue <laughs> information here, and the reason being is that um, there are, there are time frames of skips between of of time between oh when my goodness. Were and, and, and when it wasn't um, because we were getting we were getting pulses back. Um, so, what do you before we get to this next portion here? Um, any thoughts? One of the things that I'm just kind of interested in is the thought about uh, inserting T and K earlier in the resuscitation thought process. Because I agree. Um, that that's usually a Hail Mary, we're at the very end, and there might be a window of salvageability that was missed if we were to give some thoughts. Um, because I think we think really hard on the downsides of using T and K and what kind of risk we might be imposing upon the patient. Right. But in a situation like this, um, the patient certainly has a very high risk of expiring. And so um, it's been something that I've been trying to uh, contemplate when do we do this? And, and just briefly, I had a separate case where it was an acute coronary syndrome that presented as um, loss of circulation. And I, it, from a temporal standpoint, the patient showed significant improvement in return of circulation after we gave TNKs. So I can't prove it, but certainly time frame would suggest that it was a, a significant uh, uh, factor. So I'm interested in what the thought process is. As at what point do we say, look, maybe we should get this on board earlier while we still have a significant window of salvageability? Right. Yeah. I, so I agree. I think that the I think the thought of it should be considered in the first three to five minutes of your resuscitation. Right. The practical aspect of it is that um, that there's also the competing interest of like, could we get this patient to the cath lab? And so trying to make that determination and decision as to do we give this or don't we give this in, in that setting. Um, I think it's worthwhile to mention that giving, giving to that place does not preclude you from being able to take a patient to the cath lab. Right. And that, but, but that's a common consideration, right? Because we're, we're working off of generally the, the algorithm for acute coronary syndrome. Sometimes we get our algorithms um, in this setting uh, confused where the acute coronary syndrome algorithm is we'll get the patient cath lab and get the door to balloon time down, and that'll be the best issue for outcome, as opposed to the cardiac arrest algorithm 
of how do I get a patient with sustained circulation to get and get to the get to the cath lab. And so um, I think that that a more liberal use of of fibrinolytics should give should be given consideration. Uh, not necessarily employing it liberally though, because there, there needs to be the consideration of of sepsis, the consideration of possible subarachnoid hemorrhage, the right, all these other competing thoughts and or etiologies that may be present. So um, so I think the consideration should be liberal. I think the, the distribution of it should be more aggressive when when it when it's called for based on physician judgment. And so I think that, that that that's really the important key to that is how do you how do you arrive at that that uh, calculus? And I think it was a little easier in this setting having the cardiologist at the bedside looking at the EKG as well and saying, well, you know, this is really difficult to interpret, which is why a repeat EKG was being called for was to, to help to make differentiate and make that decision while we were also in the midst of trying to do an echocardiogram at the same time intermittently. And you can see after we gave to neck the place, um, this column here denotes the blood pressures that were measured. And so we got a blood pressure we were able to get a pulse back pretty quickly after T and K was given. And then you see through here, these were these were blood pressures that were maintaining. The patient was in a persistent, generally in a persistent state of hypotension and shock uh, during this entire time. Um, just even despite uh, uh, titrating um, three different pressures on the person and giving intermittent bouts of, um, sometimes giving, um, you know, quite a few doses of epi along the way here. Um, so, so we had this this going on, and there were two quick um, two quick consults that were made uh, following this. And so the first consult um, was made to um, to call interventional radiology, and the second consult that was made nearly simultaneously, so the call at least was placed out for them, was to cardiothoracic. And so a discussion was had with the interventional radiologist of, you know, I, you know, we have somebody here with massive pulmonary embolism. Um, this is diagnosed based on bedside echocardiography, EKG, and that's it in a hunch, right? And the interventional radiologist um, was like, okay, this, this is this person you know, what's, what's going on, what's their blood pressure, and, and we're describing, you know, the patient has very low blood pressure, so top pressure is 70 and 60 with, um, while on dopamine, vasopressin, and milrinone. And, and there wasn't a great deal of enthusiasm. Yeah, and by the way, we just gave, we'd also give the patient 50 of, uh, of stenectoplase. place. And so, um, so there wasn't there wasn't a tremendous amount of enthusiasm about that, but at the same time, I, while I was having the conversation with them, I was letting them know I'm also consulting cardiothoracic surgery to consider a surgical embolectomy. Um, my biggest concern was that knowing, seeing how severe the cardiac um, output had been affected, and knowing how severe the heart failure is in that moment, they're in a, you know they're in a combined. This causes a combined diastolic failure and systolic failure that occurs with it. Typically, you get a diastolic failure first, which is why tachycardia occurs. The tachycardic response is a response to the diastolic failure because you're impeding blood flow to the pulmonary, through the pulmonary artery. Therefore, you're impeding left, arter, left atrial return. So because the volume coming up your left atria is less, the left ventricle doesn't have as much to efficiently move forward, and you end up in this combined diastolic and systolic dysfunction. And as the ischemia continues to build, so does the systolic dysfunction to the heart during that period of time. So it makes sense that when you consider um, looking at heart with an ultrasound, why the right ventricle is so dilated, especially in comparison and relative to the left ventricle, which has lower end diastolic volumes, therefore is never really getting to its full, its full um, uh, ability to, to expand because there's not fluid returning to it to expand it. So the, the, the chamber sizes are, are relatively lower than normal, the left ventricle, and now in comparison to the right ventricle, that's 
that's why that's happening, right? So this combined diastolic failure and systolic failure are occurring, and so you're trying to. So I looked at that, and I, and I was thinking, you know, um, even if you get them on the, on the cath table, um, there's a mechanical support that's necessary for this. And I think you'd benefit from being placed on bypass, and while on bypass, then a front thrombectomy could be performed. And then we could see what we get, right? And so, um, so the cardiothoracic surgeon responded, came to the, came to the ED promptly. Um, we both sat down with the family and began discussing the option of, of surgery. Um, again, this was not an enthusiastic um, um, response necessarily in terms of, oh yes, I, thank you so much for calling me. I, this, I would love to take this patient to the OR, right? Was, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't the case. Um, and and not and not in criticism of the thoracic surgeon, just you know, I, I basically just handed them the consideration of a very difficult case that most likely isn't going to work out, and and they're now stuck with this responsibility, talking to family members about what can we do and what can't we do. Um, but it was, and this is the reason to share this. I think to share this case also is. In having that discussion with the family and with the, with the surgeon, it provided a lot of insight in, into some things I think that are kind of classic for medicine or thoughts about medicine um, that that we learn with experience. And one of the things I learned over the years was um, that you need you'd like you almost it's always best I should say to have a surgeon who's enthusiastic to provide the care that they're going to provide. And the lack of, of enthusiasm uh, sometimes is, is a sign in of itself to avoid that path. And so as we were discussing this, the bigger issue wasn't that the cardiothoracic surgeon couldn't perform this. It was that the thoracic surgeon didn't feel that they could recover the patient because we, don't have, we didn't have a mechanism in place to take the patient off pump if if unsuccessful, so when you get in there to try to remove the clot, the, the depending on the clot burden, and again we don't know what the clot burden is because all I have all we have is a bedside echo, and labs, and uh, and so, but the presumption is that this is a saddle embolus or near saddle as could be, and that you may not necessarily be successful in removing enough clot to change the hemodynamics. And now you have a person who's on pump who can only be on, so you can only be on, on, a, on a bypass pump for about five hours. Eight hours is kind of where you could push it, but the coagulopathy that develops in that time frame is so severe that the pump itself fails um, and the, uh, there's, like, there's a filter on these pumps. And so the filter clogs and fails, at which point you're, you're done. Right, and so that was the discussion that was being had with the family. Was this explanation of, well, I could put them on, I could put them on bypass. I can go in there. There's not a guarantee that I'm going to be successful in actually removing wow. enough clot. And um, the patient's already been given to next place two, so who knows to what degree that may affect um, the ability to retrieve enough clot as well, so on and so forth. Um, and more importantly, I think if I, if I, if to be fair to the, to the surgeon was the consideration that the patient's neurologic recovery was not anticipated to be very good, or that the quality, and even more importantly, the quality of life was not necessarily um, going to be very good following this. Um, that the patient will most likely be severely crippled by this and potentially dependent, um, have a severe degree of dependence um, as a result. And so, um, I think if I were to paraphrase their conclusion from their from the consult note was that they didn't feel that they would be able to bring the patient back to a pre-viable state that was satisfactory. And um, and the crux of that was that we didn't we couldn't put the patient on ECMO. Had we had the ability to place the patient on ECMO, then it made the embolectomy a far more easy decision to make because now we have the opportunity to 
continue the resuscitation after surgery, after a nebulectomy, and allow the heart to recover, and then determine if that was possible. And so the difference between having a cardiac bypass device and having ECMO is the difference between doing a high dive into a cup of water versus a pool. And so that's just, you know, what, one of the things I, so I sat there with the family and the family was looking to me because we now had rapport initially as to well, what should we do. And, I was, and my advice at that moment was, well, you know, if you don't have a surgeon that's enthusiastic to go to the OR, who doesn't feel like they're going to improve the viability postoperatively, and that's not necessarily the typical standard at this hospital, then we should go after this with a catheter uh, directed lysis and see if we can get more of this clot broken down with, with that and mitigate the risks of continued fibrinolysis peripherally because we'll decrease the risk of bleed of, of intracerebral hemorrhage and so on and so forth. Um, however, recognizing that, um, that there's not much we can do about that. And the family was pretty sophisticated and were aware um, and disappointed that we couldn't ECMO them. They were, they were just like, so could we transfer it? And we were like, well, no, they're not stable for transfer in this setting. So we're, this, this is where we are, you know, and sorry we don't have that. And, um, but, you know, our next best option is, is catheter uh, directed lysis. So um, in order to get to that point, um, interventional radiology wanted a CT scan. Uh, and I think that's a reasonable request. Um, and so a CT scan was, was ordered. Uh, it had already been ordered up front, but you know, the patient was in such extremis and coming in and out of ROSC that it was hard to get them over there. So once we finally um, got uh, some sustained ROSC for a while, um, and again, you see the pressures here are 77 over 44, 89 over 49, 84. Um, I was happy with, to be in the 80s at all. Um, we got the patient to the CAT scan, um, and over on over on the table, the patient coded again, and then we resuscitated on the table. Um, gave additional bicarb because at this point, I know I know that I've got the ABG back now, showing me my pH 6.92. I have them on a bicarb drip. I'm giving pushes of bicarb. And I'm trying to get as much physiologic response from the medica medical therapy as I can, and um, and we get the CT done. So starting here, um, here's the um, superior vena cava, here's the right atria, uh, and here's the um, the initial portion of the, pul of the pulmonary artery. So um, so the origin of the pulmonary artery is here. Um, just as it begins to bifurcate, you can see this large clot um, all right there on, on, in the proximal left pulmonary artery. And the very next cut, you begin seeing the extent of the clot on the right side as well. So it wasn't exactly at the saddle, which would more or less be right here, but pretty close. And this is post TNK, so I'm sure we got a little bit of movement on it following that. Here's the, um, the coronal view. Um, again, just showing all of this cl this large clot burden on either side of the pulmonary arteries, um, and there's a great and there's actually a large amount of pulmonary infarction on the right lung in particular. Here is uh, a, a view of the uh, of the right ventricle and left ventricle. Again, showing that the right ventricle was about 70 millimeters in in diameter. Uh, while the left ventricle was 46 millimeters. Again, this this shows this really I think helps show that physiology of of you've got this bowed out um, dilated ventricle, um, this diminished left ventricular size because of the poor return of flow to the left ventricle. So now the end diastolic volumes are very low, and so the left ventricle is more compressed than it typically is, and and um, and you can see the contrast timing um, also that, that most of the contrast is well over here in the RV because it's not really being pushed forward because of flow support. So the patient went to the patient went to the cath lab um, and in the cath lab is getting um, uh, catheter directed lysis um, 
went into uh, a PEA arrest again after lysis had already been completed. And they did the lysis with a, um, so it's, it's a catheter that's instilled into the pulmonary artery. And the catheters we have here are called ECOS catheters because they're also an ultrasound catheter. And so it has dual lumens. One lumen is for delivery of um, fibrinolytic. And our technique here is to give a bolus of fibrinolytic and continued infusion over 24 hours. The second lumen is an ultrasound that uses high frequency ultrasound to try to um, perturb the uh, clot and try to increase the clot breakdown. So that's, that's what's used here. Um, so the procedure had been performed and completed, and following the completion, the patient went back into PEA arrest. We continued CPR and then um, de determined that since we had no other opportunity for mechanical support or otherwise to just cease efforts um, at that point, and there was no longer a neurologic response from the patient, and, uh, and then discussed with the family members and, ex and explained our, or gave our condolences. So this was was um, you know not obviously not your typical PE case and nothing I would say that I don't think there was anything necessarily typical about about the resuscitation. The um, consultations were were uh, interesting to have. There were some sideway glances about um, um, about getting the cardiothoracic surgeon at the bedside. You know, I realized I was making a request that was not typical um, and having to explain, I understand I'm calling you and I know that this is not normally how we would handle PE, but this is why I think, you know, this is a consideration. Um, and, um, and I think all in all, um, um, we gave the patient the most amount of resources that we could that our hospital would provide under the circumstances. And I think the team itself, um, certainly had a lot of good effort from all the team members, the nurses, the techs, and everybody involved in this case, um, did really excellent CPR. Uh, there was good communication throughout. There, were, there wasn't, a, you know, we had great support from, from pharmacy as well. Um, and uh, there was, uh, you know, there were certain challenges, but, uh, but all in all, um, I don't look back at this with a lot of regret in terms of how we managed the case. Um, but like anything, if I'm critical, if I could do it again, there are certain things I would do slightly differently. And, uh, and I'll, I think I'll explain that through the rest here. Any comments, questions? So this patient expired after the procedure was right. done at some point. So um, since presumably more of the clock burden was alleviated by the procedure, do you feel he expired just because this, the severity of the initial insult was una, unable to be uh, survived? Yeah, and I think it's also you know this is a this is a catheter directed lysis. So what this wasn't is this wasn't a um, a catheter directed embolectomy. Yeah. And so I'm not certain that that the clot burden was changed all that much. Okay. And and. Having been through an autopsy of a patient who had, who was young, who was 41 years old when he died, um, and I had an, e, this other patient had an EKG that showed a STEMI, and so we pushed fibrinolytics in that patient during during the arrest, and there wasn't an improvement. Uh, there was a brief ROS, but we couldn't we couldn't even get that patient with cath lab. And I wasn't, and the patient looked healthy. Like it, it just, it didn't make sense that a STEMI was there. But it, but certainly, like it was a clear cut STEMI on the EKG, um, and and that one, I, if I recall, was an anterior STEMI. And so I called the coroner on that and said, you know, hey, when you do the when you do the autopsy, will you call me? And so then I went down the LA coroner's office. This is when I was practicing up in LA. I went to the coroner's office and. Um, and as we op opened up the heart, the coronaries were completely clean. And when we got to the pulmonary artery, it was burdened with, with a lot of clot, and the clot showed a lot of sedimentary changes. So it had really gone through a period of, um, of evolution and had, had really taught me that it's difficult to get adequate acute 
recanalization when you do have a really large clobber. Just I think you know I think it's hard to I think it's hard to rely on that. I think that if you have um, multiple secondary um, diffuse pulmonary emboli, those patients probably you know those patients are are perfect candidates for catheter lysis because you, you mechanically can't reach them and and there's enough collateral flow that you're going to have time to treat them and they're going to do okay but those primary those proximal central PEs that are that are like that um, I think it's really I think it's a, I think it's a very deadly disease and, and extremely difficult to to rely on the medication alone which is why I think a mechanical option is there and looking back at this if I had to do this again I might have counseled the, the family differently and said listen he's gonna you know I'm nearly certain he's gonna die from a catheter lesion I do think this is a mechanical disease and I think we should just try it and if it happens it happens and if he dies on the table then you have to accept that we are making that either either path either practitioner whether it was the interventional radiologist or the cardiothoracic surgeon, was was in a bad situation clinically. Like I, the, you know, they, they, it was a hail mary for either one of them. And I think, considering this as a mechanical disease, then the mechanical option is the better option than is the medical option. Just based on where, especially where that clot burden was, and seeing what its effect on on the pump was itself. So. Three hours of, you know, if you, if I think if you can give somebody three hours of pump time, that's a lot better than zero hours of mechanical support, and then hoping that a very weak heart that is causing very poor circulation is going to be dependent on a drug that has to be delivered on that mechanism, right? This is this this kind of goes to a, to you know other mechanical like my thoughts on uh, my thoughts with thoughts that you know, on like uh, epidural hematomas, right? Well, an expanding hematoma causing mass effect increases intracranial pressure, which decreases cerebral perfusion pressure. And if our treatment option medically is to give mannitol and hypertonic saline that requires perfusion to the area that's having an increasingly decreased perfusion, we should be thinking that that's going to have much of an effect, yeah. right? So the, 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 the treatment option is to prioritize each other mechanical treatment, right, in that setting. And I think in this setting, similarly, when there is an obstruction that's so proximal, that the mechanical aspect really should be done. And so we had a thoracic surgeon that was willing to take the patient to the OR. Um, and I think looking back, it would have been a way of just trying to mitigate that, um, that, uh, oh, that's the best way of putting it. Not fair to say, and it, 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 thoracic surgeon have a negative attitude about it, but just the, um, but they certainly, you know, their lack of enthusiasm was an issue. Um, pessimism, that's the word I'm looking for. Okay. I think I would have tried to better mitigate the pessimism right. and just say, let's accept it and, and make this attempt. Um, I don't, and I don't necessarily think that. The, the, the outcome may have changed because of it, but but looking back from a thought perspective, it seems like that would be the better thought between the two. You know, if I was if I was removed from the situation, no longer involved emotionally with the family and with the patient and so on and so forth, and just looking at this as a strict issue of, of is this a mechanical disease or is this a medical disease, and which way which way do I need to go? then I, I think that the path towards me mechanistic interventions is a little brighter than the other two of them. Um, this is a, um, a uh, picture from showing the catheter inserted into the pulmonary artery and the initial blush of, uh, of contrast um, here. It was, you could see that there was, as it gave the initial blush and push here, that there was not a lot of push of, of it going down. So on either side of the of the pulmonary artery, um, there was there was enough significant burden 
that, uh, and this was the initiation of placing it, so you just, you can appreciate that this was a large clapper. So, what is a surgical, sorry, so what does a surgical embolectomy look like? Let me see if I, sorry. I think I can just copy and paste this. I'll open that, sorry about better. There we go. Copy. We'll open up another one here. There we go. Paste. Video assistance in surgical pulmonary embolectomy. Medians do not misperform. Cardiopulmonary bypass is established using ascending aortic and bicable cannulation with systemic hypothermia 32 degrees Celsius. The main pulmonary artery is open longitudinally and visible plots are extracted from main and proximal branch pulmonary arteries. Right. A 5 mm flexible tip video endoscope is then passed into left pulmonary artery. Distal emboli wedged into segmental arteries are extracted using process. The process is repeated on the right side. Care is taken not to injure the intima. Complete clearance of bilateral segmental arteries is ensured. The right atrium is opened after snaring the KV and inspected for thrombus in transit. The video endoscope is used to explore the right ventricle thrombi in transit are extracted. Complete clearance of right ventricular apex and right ventricular outflow tract up to the pulmonary valve is ensured. Pulmonary artery and right atrium are closed. Patient is reborn. An IVC filter is placed and cardiopulmonary bypass is weak. Right. Yeah, cardiothoracic surgery is pretty cool. It's satisfying to watch to actually see it, like right removed. It, and it also kind of you know when you think about well, and and not to take anything away from the catheter directed lysis, but in a in a proximal high burden issue, yeah. you realize that the it's hard to drip a medicine on that and think that you're gonna actually that you're gonna actually undo the burden of. Of yeah. that, and so that's why, you know, looking at this now, far down the stream from when this event occurred, it's easier for me to say, well, I think I would push for the mechanical option, just the same. And 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 it's easy in that situation because you can see this is working. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or or maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Like we have no idea how that patient was going to recover. Um, they use cardioplegia to decrease the movement of the heart and have a patient on bypass during all of that. So when you go back and you and you look at that, um, you know, there's no guarantee that once they remove the patient with cardioplegia that the patient's going to do well. Right. Right. Um, but this is also being done at Mount Sinai, which is going to have, as an academic center, have more resources, have ECMO, have other options of, of resuscitating this patient in the post-operative phase um, that aren't that aren't feasible this time in a community hospital, or in many community hospitals, I should say. Um, and so, that's, that's part of it, and so we'll get into the rest of the science of this here in a moment. So first, here's a, an article on catheter-based embolectomy for acute pulmonary embolism. Um, this is this was an interesting article by Jaber and McDaniel that discusses the various different devices, technical considerations, risks, and benefits. And this certainly is an area that's becoming um, uh, receiving a lot of attention uh, from device manufacturers as well as just I think a, a general current that exists where. Um, it seems attractive 
to take patients to the lab as opposed to the operating room. And so you can do percutaneous pulmonary embolectomy as well with these new with these different devices. And so he, here's an example of a um, of a device where you direct a catheter uh, here and then have an element on it that allows suction to be applied and um, and can also direct lysis as well as sucking through this and using a pump here to bring up a lot of clot. So this is a way to break that clot up into a lot of pieces. There's um, there's discussions about well, you know, even if you don't remove the entire clot, if you macerate it and make it possible for blood flow to to go around the sides of this, that that may be sufficient in and of itself to recover the patient later. There still may be a considerable amount of chronic uh, pulmonary hypertension that develops in those patients, but you're maybe getting these patients to survival when you wouldn't have otherwise. So that's, I think, the the, um, the thought process of doing a catheter-based embolectomy and the various different uh, devices that exist to do that. Uh, the challenges here is, is that you're attempting to remove a large organized thrombi, and that organized portion is kind of what I mentioned earlier about seeing that sedimentation within the clot itself. Um, it's difficult to manipulate through large spaces because they're tortuous, the thrombi are frequently involved in many branches, so it's difficult to visualize and navigate, even even on a mechanical basis. Right, you could see that the surgeon was able to get in, but was concerned about causing intimal injury. So even placing a device in and of itself is very difficult, uh, and you're only going to get to you're you're only going to be able to do that with the central lesions. You're not going to be able to do anything to the ones coming off the initial branches. Right, so and. And sometimes, you know, like anything else, real estate matters, and the amount of total burden in the periphery is just as important with pulmonary hypertension as anything else. Um, just it doesn't have the same mechanical disadvantage that you do with central embolism, right? But you should have the same problem with hypoxia, with large peripheral burden. So um, there's a risk of vascular complication at the access sites, uh, unclear endpoints. This is this was this is a part that I think is really worthwhile to mention is that, you know, to what degree do you remove the clot, or you know, like what what is it that you're looking for as your response of like I've removed enough clot or or not. In the in the surgical case that's video assisted, it's simple. It's what I can see, and what I can reach, and that's it. So it's a, it's the the Endpoint is an endpoint of convenience, um, but in this case, the endpoints are a little bit diff are a little bit more difficult. Are we removing till we receive get to a particular PA pressure, to a particular right ventricular size, to a certain amount of thrombus reduction, um, so on and so forth? Just the endpoints are are quite clear, um, and there is a lack of scientific evidence behind. Um, the thrombectomy. This is these are newer devices. There's not a robust amount of patients that have been studied with this. Um, and as devices are being developed, they're getting F, you know even from this article, I think it was a 2016 article. Um, even from that point to where we are now, many devices have now received FDA um, clearance, which um, is a very different process than FDA approval. FDA clearance means that you've gone through and show that you've created a device that's substantially equivalent in its design to a previously FDA approved device. Doesn't necessarily mean and guarantee that it will behave in the same way and that it will have the same outcomes. And that's where there's a lot of controversy, um, both in the lay literature as well as, 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 our, as, well as the um, scientific literature as to that 510K process and how well does that provide us instruments that are, that are useful. Um, and then there's no currently available device to remove the majority of the PE. The goal of the treatment is usually to remove or macerate as much thrombi as possible. So just an important thing to kind of recognize the difference between this technique and the surgical approach of just visualizing and removing what you can see. And then here it said none of the devices currently on the market are approved or cleared by the U.S. So that's not true. That's there's there now. That may have been true then when they wrote this. It's just not true now. Um, so this is from um, circulations from American Heart Scientific Statements. This is kind of their guideline statements on interventional therapies for pulmonary embolism. This is uh, the 2019 guidelines. 
Um, I need to bring this up because what's also available is the 2011 guidelines for management. So there's quite a discrepancy between the two um, because a matter of things have changed over that time period. And so Dr. Geary's um, is the most up-to-date definition. So massive pulmonary emboli is defined as um, as being massive. So massive embolism is is a definition that the American Heart Association definition. In Europe, it's referred to as high risk. So the ESC is a European uh, society of uh, cardiology, and so they define it as high risk. We say massive, but those that's a trans that's a translation between the two. Um, but it's defined as hypotension with stop pressure less than 90 uh, millimeters of mercury for at least 15 minutes, or a drop of greater than 40 millimeters of mercury uh, for that for that period. Uh, obviously, that's difficult to know unless you know what their blood pressure was prior to that. So if they're coming to you with a blood pressure of 90, you know, 85, or well, that's less than 90. Let's say they're coming to you with a pressure of 90 or 95, and they were at 160, and so they dropped more than 40 in that time period, and they're looking like, and they're looking like they're in shock. Um, that's a definition of this being a PE, a massive PE. Um, and or the need for vasopressor support identifies those patients. They account for less than or up to about 5% of hospitalized patients with PE. Um, but to me, this is the most interesting group. Like, this is the group that I want to know how to resuscitate. And I was talking to a resident the other day and saying to them, you know, by the time you're a senior resident, you know, at least, at least if you're in a four-year program, but by the time you're through your third year, you should have finished reading whatever textbook you're residency uses. Like, that should be nearly memorized by the end of your third year. And that your fourth year is spent refining that information and starting to read other starting to read other texts, picking out specific texts. And I'm like, you know, so your fourth year isn't about learning how to diagnose a pulmonary embolism. Your fourth year is about learning what to do with a massive pulmonary embolism, right? Um, and those types of things are kind of where that refinement comes. And I was like, and, and it's not just your fourth year, it's your first five years of practice and then 10 years of practice and so on and so forth where like I don't feel like I'm at a point in my career where you know that, that I don't need to do that or hate like I'm constantly pulling other looking at other um, texts and journals to try to figure out you know what should I do and so um, the important part here is also note that you know the high mortality rate so it's 30 percent mortality rate with massive PE. And so that's always worthwhile to explain to family members when somebody's being admitted, like, listen, you know, we have a pulse back now, but there's a 30% chance they're not going to survive. So, you know, approach this with that consideration. The sudden massive um, PE, we're, we're going to skip for just a moment um, and come down to low risk. Right, so low risk is a term that's defined by both ESC and AHA. And here, these are patients who don't meet criteria for submassive or an intermediate risk based on uh, on the European guidelines. They account for 40 to 60 percent of hospitalized patients with PE and have an average mortality of of one percent within one month. Um, many of these patients, even of this group here, where it says 40 to 60 percent hospitalized, many of these patients don't require hospitalization. Many of them can just be discharged on anticoagulation therapy. So, so let's come to that intermediate group. Here's a group that's defined as having RV strain without hypotension. We primarily, and we primarily identify these patients through strain by either RV dysfunction on CT, and I showed that earlier of what that looks like by looking at the differences in chamber size. Um, and or echocardiography where there's RV left ventricular ratio differences greater than greater than 90 percent. So if the um, RV is 90 percent of, of the left ventricle in terms of its diameter and size, then that's that's the abnormal finding. Super important to mention that that matters on the view you obtain with your with your echo. So these are echoes of four chamber views. It's not an echo of a parasternal long axis. And often patient people perform a parasternal, I've seen residents do this where they perform parasternal long axis and they see the RV is dilated. 
you're not looking at the RV in a parish normal long axis. You're looking at the right ventricular outflow tract. So you're looking at the outflow tract to the pulmonary artery because that's what's right in front of you on that, on that level. When you look at a heart right there, you're overlying the art in that, in that second, third intercostal space. You're overlying the, the pulmonary artery. So you're using the window of that right for, uh, portion of the RV, but that right ventricular outflow then shadowing over the left ventricle. So the peristernal view is really a view of the left ventricle with a little bit of right ventricular outflow tract. So the place to look for this is on a four-chamber view, and on the four-chamber view, then you can compare ventricle sizes to each other. And so that's where this ratio becomes, um, becomes reasonable. Um, and so the further RVG injury is detected on the increased cardiac biomarkers as well. So it's important to get troponins and BNPs on these patients. Um, those are both, those are increased troponins and BNPs are both signs of increased um, risks of mortality. Um, there are differences, and it's worthwhile to recognize that there are differences in patients that are in this category. This is not a homogeneous category of patients with RV dysfunction. There are patients with RV dysfunction, and there are patients with RV dysfunction. There are folks that, that are dying, you know, potentially going to die from the RV dysfunction, and those that have mild dysfunction um, but have intact contractility in the left ventricle. And when you see that in contractility left ventricle, it's a good sign because you know there's enough negative pressure being to being achieved to draw fluid forward into the left ventricle and out and, and maintain stroke volumes. So, um, and so to further um, evaluate that 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 heterogeneity in the submassive group um, is this idea of also looking at a at a simplified pulmonary embolism severity index. And this is defines patients that are looking at patients who are over 80 or who have cancer or who have chronic respiratory disease or cardiac disease, um, tachycardia with heart rates greater than 110 or systolic pressures less than 100 or SATs less than 90%. So any one of these is abnormal and takes you into a high risk submassive group. So within that group, you your actions may be more aggressive in somebody who's over idea with chronic and so on and so forth. Um, probably the bigger factor being somebody who has persistent tachycardia and persistent hypotension or near persistent hypotension. Um, and you, you can begin to see like when you're in this category, why this greater than 40 mil drop of greater than 40 millimeters was used to define the massive group. So it's, a little there's there's some gray zone there as to am I dealing with a massive person with a with a massive PE who's not hypotensive but has a significant drop versus a person with a submassive who's approaching that. It's just it's it's a continuum is I guess the point that I make. So the current factors for uh, used to categorize PE severity is to Again, this consideration of age, cancer, heart and lung disease, dyspnea, shock, and mental confusion, um, examination of the heart rate, elevated um, jugular pressure, uh, pulse ox, respiratory effort, and hypotension. Um, you know, most often these patients, um, when patients with PE present to us, not with necessarily with massive PE, but with um, any PE, the, the chief complaint usually is more vague of dyspnea or dyspnea on exertion. So, um, you know, from a med mouse perspective and looking at this from the perspective of the mutual and saying like, what can we do to better improve recognition of PE? Um, it's to recognize that patients who are presenting with shortness of breath or dyspnea exertion may be the subtle findings of the EKG, uh, maybe the subtle findings of, of PE for, in terms of complaint. And so that that, that should shouldn't necessarily always warrant a diagnostic workup in that sense, but should always warrant the, the thought and consideration of, of PE. So, um, is that fair? No. Okay. So, um, where are the contraindications for using th for uh, fibrinolysis? Um, somebody who's got structural intracranial disease, previous intracranial 
cranial hemorrhage, ischemic stroke within the past three months, active bleeding, recent brain or spinal surgery, recent head trauma with fracture or brain injury, and the bleeding diathesis. So those are the majors. The, the, um, the relative contraindications are consideration of patients with, with, with uh, elevated blood pressure as well. This is, these are just risk factors for intracranial hemorrhage on somebody's given fibrinolytic anyway. This doesn't really apply to the patient that you're giving it to because you wouldn't be, if the patient has a systolic pressure in 180, I'm like, right? Like you're not thinking about doing that with, with that patient. But so just to put in context with like where this information is coming from, right? So I look at the relative contraindications and think, okay, well, yeah, these are risks. This is a group that's going to be slightly increased risk of, of, of a bleeding complication uh, following that. Here are the different types of, uh, of catheters that are used. Um, this is the one that we have here at Palmar, the Ecosonic. Um, it's a five French catheter. Um, here, again, the regulatory status shows they have 510K clearance for infusion and treatment of PE, as do all these other devices. These are different catheter directed lysis devices. Um, this also includes um, embolectomy devices like Angiovac, which is a vena vena, vi vena, vena bypass. Um, that's used in a funnel-shaped inflow tip, and basically it's like a, it's a large suction catheter, as is the flow retriever. Um, and then there are um, other devices that are, that use um, a rheolytic therapy, basically where they're where they're pulsing um, and taking uh, flow with uh, sal with sterile saline and rushing it back to create a suction effect mm -hmm. to kind of help pull um, that back as well. So. Again, here's catheter-directed thrombolysis. It's administration of um, fibrinolytic into the PA circulation. Um, the benefits of this is that you decrease the total amount of fibrinolytic that's used. The, um, the issue there is that, is that this is being done in a number of different ways um, and often is a 24-hour infusion rather than just a sick, you know, rather than just a static event. The alternative is the device that, that's shown here. This is what we have here, an Ecosonic uh, device. Um, this is an infusion catheter with an um, ultrasound uh, endovascular system that uh, uses high-frequency, low-energy ultrasound um, to perturb the uh, clot and facilitate the dissociation of the fibrin strands. And so theoretically, it's more effective in thrombolysis um, and again, at lower allows lower doses of this. Um, it's um, it's a simple uh, catheter approach, um, and can be placed in one or both PAs, uh, both pulmonary arteries. Um, and the infusion is typically over 24 to up to 12 to up to 24 hours. But there's a lot of data showing now that you can begin to get improvement within the first two to four hours. Realytic thrombectomy, this is using an angio jet catheter, um, um, which is uh, placing in the pulmonary artery and, uh, and is a high-speed saline, saline jet traveling backwards from the tip of the catheter, creating a vacuum and thrombus fragmentation. So the overall summary of these different devices is that, um, is that they are there to facilitate removal um, and there are, there's an option for embolectomy with them um, as opposed to just catheter-directed uh, therapy. And there's, uh, uh, there's been FDA approval and clearance for both the Ecosonic and Flowtriever. And again, uh, so, um, so one, I'm going to mention this study for a moment because this is, there is a tremendous amount of literature looking at this. There's not a lot of great studies in trial design, um, but, there, but there have been some recently, and the Pytho study was one of the more recent ones that was based in Europe, looking at a combined effect of mortality and hemodynamic collapse within seven days. So that was the combined outcome that was looked at, and patients who received place had um, had either mortality or hemodynamic collapse within seven days, 2.6% of the time, versus those that received anticoagulation therapy only, and that was 5.6%. Mm -hmm. 
when you broke this down and, and, and really got into the mortality aspects, there was no impact on overall mortality at seven days, 2.4% in, in the next place versus 3.2%. This is one of the aspects of, of statistics, statistics that I've always liked talking to people about, is when you're looking at the data and saying, well, is there a statistical difference? And then it makes you really think, well, how many patients were enrolled? Do we have enough power? So on and so forth. But there was a practicality that I learned from uh, this, uh, this guy, Michael White, who taught me statistics. And he'd written a bunch of uh, white papers for the, um, for the National Health, Health Institute, or sorry, um, for NHS for England, and um, and he always said, you know, sometimes it's as simple as looking at something and asking yourself, which group would I rather be in, right? Well, I'd rather be in the group that has a 2.4 percent mortality than the group that has the that has the the higher mortality than the 3.2, right? Um, and this is just a single trial, so it's not a complete, you know, it's not a complete way of ignoring statistics, right? Like I'm not looking at them and just trying to fool myself, but it's, it's the idea of, well, you know, there's always one group that you'd rather be in more than the other when you're looking at this. And a lot of the decisions we make are sometimes as simple as that. And most decisions we make are not based on what this what these values are. They're actually based on the extremes. And I'll give you an example. If your life depended on, this is silly, but if your life depended I'm purchasing a Ferrari, and I told you the average price of a Ferrari was $100,000, and that the 95% confidence interval for that was 80,000 to 160,000. And again, I'm giving you the issue, this this fake issue of your life depends on this. How much money do you bring with you to the dealer? Right. Bring as much as I mean you're gonna bring the larger amount if you if you're right. You're making you're making your decision on the confidence interval. Right. You're not making it on the on the average. Right. 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 So and that's because you're enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, if it was an issue of like you have to buy this for your ex wife, <laughs> how much money is do you bring to the to you know to that right? Well, then it's eighty thousand because right. then you're like, well, you know what? It was it was within the confidence interval. Right. We can't get it right or right, right. So the the the, the skeptic and enthusiast of, of of that decision making really shows that most of the decision making you're making isn't based on the statistic of the average that's reported in the literature. It's based on the confidence interval, which is why confidence intervals are so important. But it's also why they're so misunderstood by by the majority of scientists that are practicing because they just they're, they're not they're not thinking of it that way either and the only people that do it are people who have to pay the bill right if you've got a new drug and it's going to cost x amount you want to know well what's the number needed to treat and that's what's what's the average number needed to treat i want to know the confidence intervals to get an idea of what is my real bang for buck here am i doing this because i'm going to Get great benefit from every two patients they treat, or is it like, or is it like the instance of uh, statins for heart disease? For every fifty thousand patients I treat, right? You've got a five thousand number need to treat average, but a confidence interval that may be taking you out to fifty thousand. Suddenly, if you're a healthcare system having to make those purchases, it, it really makes you realize it's the confidence intervals that are that are driving those decisions, not the not the averages. Anyway. Enough of that. Um, this study was important because I'm going to flip through some things here for a moment. We'll come back to this. This is so. Here's the 2011 American Heart uh, Guidelines, and here again, uh, same proposal for PE, massive PE definition, systolic pressure less than 90 for 15 minutes. Um, they didn't have the 40, the 40 millimeter drop then um, in their definition. Um, and the definition for submassive was PE with RV dysfunction. I like this because this was a nice description of what we were talking about with RV dysfunction. At least one of the following, RV dilatation, apical floor chamber, RV diameter, divided by left ventricular diameter greater than 90%. Right? That's just a nicer way of putting it and like certainly clearer than what the, the more recent guideline described. Um, 
looking at RV dilatation um, on the CT, again, you want to see that with at the four-chamber view on the CT, not at, at some other slice in between. Um, elevation of B and P uh, greater than 90, uh, pro B and P greater than 500, um, ECG changes. Um, it's often that there's a, either a bundle branch block or a nonspecific block that occurs because the septum becomes injured during as a part of this, right? You get supple bowing, which is why a wide complex dysrhythmia PEA arrest is more common in the PE patient than it is in the ACS, ACS patient. So that looking at that EKG, that was a good EKG for somebody having a PE, right? It was tachycardic, it was wide complex. Um, and then myocard myocardionecrosis is defining that submassive group. Um, the recommendations were for anybody that has um, that has PE to be treated with uh, anticoagulation therapy um, and has no contraindications to it. Um, this is this is something that's interesting to me to see now as we're in a phase of using um, American College of Radiology documentation for justification of our CT studies, right? Um, I, I, I can appreciate why it's there and, and the issue of trying to limit the use of resources, but it, it potentially creates a medical legal problem. And the reason being is that, is that we may be either incorrectly assigning and misclassifying patients as intermediate risk when they're low risk with a positive D-dimer. Mm -hmm. And people are looking at the D-dimer and saying, well, the D-dimer is positive, so now they're intermediate risk. Um, the reason that I think that that's a, a potential issue is that the national guidelines are that if you have an intermediate, if, you, if the patient's intermediate probability or high clinical probability of PE, that therapeutic anticoagulation should occur during the diagnostic workup and not based on the diagnostic workup. So delays in treatment could be a sign where you've you've documented for yourself that this patient was at intermediate risk and you didn't treat in that time frame. From a practical standpoint, it makes perfect sense to wait for treatment in an ambiguous situation when you're not quite certain that that's a leading diagnosis anyway. But in a high in a high clinical probability, it doesn't make sense. Like if if you if this patient's coming through the door and they've had multiple PEs and DVTs and they're tachycardic and high, and hypoxic, but with normal blood pressure, we well, should treat them with the uh, anticoagulant. Sure. While while you're while they're getting CT, and I often don't I often call the hospitalist for admission before the CTs are resulted because it's not going to change the the disposition. The patient's going to be admitted to a tel telemetry floor for chest pain. I've already given a dose of, of anticoagulant. The only thing that's affected is the second dose of anticoagulant and timing, which will be obtained while it's by the time the CT scan is resulted and, and has carries transition. And I think this is also one of those situations where many of these treatment paradigms take into consideration physiologic indicators, things that are direct to the patient. But I think that increasingly, as we are in complex work environments, we also have to consider our overall practice situation. So in this situation, if I'm knowing I'm going to get that CT scan right now, then I might feel less motivated to start therapeutic anticoagulation. On the other hand, if I know that my situation is resource limited and I'm going to have a significant delay, I might be more motivated to go ahead and just give them a dose of anticoagulation, knowing that that, that delta of diagnosis time is going to expand as well. Right, right, yeah. We know that suddenly you're down to one CT scanner and it's, in, you know, and it's mm -hmm. running hot because there's a bunch, of, a bunch of strokes and a bunch of traumas that have just come in and you know that there's going to be delays. It's reasonable to, to treat uh, during that time frame. So, um, again, this is always the enthusiast and skeptic mm -hmm. approach, right? You get, you get somebody who comes in who's just like, I don't really think PE is that big of a deal. And they're just like, I'm just going to hold off and wait until there's a result. And so in some respects, that person's ultra conservative, right? And then at the same time, the person who's like, well, listen, you know, this is the end of my shift. 
I'm clicking that off right now, yeah. and I'm dispoing this patient. Well, that person seems to be, you know, ultra enthusiastic right. about it. So, um, but it's emergency medicine. The criticism is always there. So, um, again, going back to this point. So, this is the this is the slide I wanted to show you. So, previously in 2011, the approved FDA indications for PE treatment were streptokinase, urocaine, kinase, all the place with 100 milligram infusion over two hours. Um, this is since there are some revisions to this. The standard is still 100 milligrams over two hours um, uh, for that, but there's now standards to decrease risks of bleeding to 50 milligrams over one hour. So um, that's and, but here's the relative effect of fibrin specificity and uh, changing plasmin uh, effects is is a two plus effect in comparison to streptokinase and neurokinase. So streptokinase and neurokinase are the benchmark, and alteplase was a strong is a stronger lytic than streptokinase and neurokinase are. Tenecteplase is stronger than alteplase is. And has a faster effect. It's easier to infuse because you're going to give an IV bolus over five seconds. So this is, in my opinion, this is what you do during CPR because you don't have two hours of infusion, right? It doesn't make sense. So it's never made sense to me that that we talk about TPAing a patient in the ER um, because if they're in our ER for two hours with a severe problem like this. Then there's a problem with our ER not giving the patient out, and two, right? So, but in the CPR situation, like it's just you're not going to do two hours CPR. So, just just give the 30 to 50 milligrams of tenecteplase. That's that's the one to go with. But in 2011, this wasn't FDA approved. So that's why that study that came out, the Pytho study, when it came out, was that. And there's another study called Topcoat uh, that looked at treatment for submassive PE with severe RV dysfunction. Um, both showed improvement in um, in immediate decrease in pulmonary artery pressures and reduced uh, pulmonary artery hypertension. But the the flip side to that is there's not a lot of there's not a lot of data supporting that there's a change in mortality rate based on fibrinolytics, and there's not in there's not a big difference um, at the effects of pulmonary hypertension seven days out. So it's much faster, and you decrease the pulmonary hypertension burden sooner, um, but most, but many patients will get to that benefit within a week or longer of anticoagulation therapy. So this was the recommendation of the algorithm by the American Heart Association was that if you reached a threshold um, where a patient requires treatment for pulmonary embolism to give consideration to, um, to, oh, sorry, to, is a submassive without RV strain, meaning that there's that the patient was low risk. It's just heparin anticoagulation therapy, or or Lovenox, or now post 2011, it's no ax. So Zerelto, Eliquis, so on and so forth. If it's submassive with RV strain, then you're going to give anticoagulation therapy and then make assessments and determine is there evidence of shock, any hypotension, abnormal shock index. Again, that patient had, the patient we described earlier had an abnormal shock index on EMS arrival. They had a stock pressure of 98 and a heart rate of 122. So they're, you know, in general, your, um, your heart rate should be 70% of your systolic blood pressure. So heart rate of 70 with a stock pressure of 100, that's kind of the norm. So once your heart rate begins to increase and you begin to change that ratio, um, you realize that, that that's an abnormal, uh, abnormal ratio. The respiratory distress with low SATs, with um, severe um, reports of dyspnea. Um, so that's, that's one evidence group. The other evidence group is RV dysfunction as hypokinesis um, with either an estimated uh, right ventricular systolic pressure of greater than 40 millimeters or abnormal biomarkers. So this is where the troponin and BNP values become important. There's no contraindication in all the place, 100 milligrams over two hours. So that was 
Those are the 2011 recommendations. This is still the recommendation today of 100 milligrams over two hours. IV, I think it's totally reasonable in, in somebody who's got RV dysfunction, whose CT scan doesn't show a large, doesn't show a large mechanical saddle embolism that has a lot of periphery, has large peripheral burden, then yeah, great. They're gonna do, they're gonna do fine uh, with that when when they have signs of myocardial necrosis and heart failure with an elevated BNP. But obviously if they're at that point, they've been surviving long enough for the BNP to elevate and for the troponin to elevate. And then if you're in, sh in shock, well then it's go directly to fibrinolysis if there's no contraindications. So that was the 2011 guidelines. Um, the only other thing I think worth mentioning is this idea of improving a multidisciplinary response to PEs. And this is where I think it would be beneficial if we at least had some discussion of a form, more formalized approach to these massive PE patients, where the sideway glances aren't occurring when you're making that, that consult in, in real time, but that there's been a multidisciplinary discussion at the hospital where those people who are stakeholders, the cardiologists, intensivists, cardiothoracic surgeons, anesthesiologists, emergency physicians, sit down and say, what, you know, how do we want to, like, what do we want to do to say we're going to be excellent at this? And so I don't know that you necessarily have to have a, a pulmonary embolism response team that's like a STEMI team that's like, right? But I do think that it's worthwhile to sit down with colleagues on cases that are really difficult like this and have a preemptive plan, a disaster management plan of the massive PE patients where we might agree with each other as to how, how do we do that? Because my thought of this, looking back at this, is, well, this was a mass, this is a mechanical thing, may be mitigated by a number of other perspectives, which is why I don't think that, you know, I don't want to, it's always careful, I'm always concerned whenever I'm giving these talks absent of a, another specialist in the room that I'm, I don't want to overstate or understate something. I just, it's, and it's, it's a challenge. Um, so here's an algorithm, algorithmic approach um, based on uh, Rosen's. Rosen's is, suggests, you know, assess the pretest probability, either Gestalt or Well score or revised Neva score, and then work and then go through your algorithm, right? The problem with this is that um, a lot of people forget what the Well score is or what the revised Geneva score is, and who was who it applies to and who it doesn't apply to, more importantly. And the bigger problem is a lot of people will use a well score or, or the Geneva score to decide who not to do workup on for PE. And the, the reason that's a problem is those scores are scores meant to how to interpret the D-dimer. They, they are not a pretest pre probability system to avoid getting a D-dimer or to avoid doing workup for pulmonary embolism. So you can't sit there and, and quote a well score and then and then say, so I didn't do a workup of PE because their well score was so low. Um, that that opens you up to medical medical legal risk because you're basically using an instrument incorrectly and showing ignorance of how the instrument's used. And so when you actually follow this algorithm, this algorithm's a correct algorithm. Right? You you have this you have a consideration, does my patient have a PE or not? And I'm considering that either from my gestalt or I'm using a formalized uh, decision support tool. And if I think it's low, right, and the patient's under 50, and their heart rate is this, and they're not on, they're not on, uh, on contraceptives or some hormonal therapy, and right, so not just contra contraceptives, but on testosterone therapy. Like we had a case that we discussed in the mutual but the patient was receiving testosterone therapy, had a history of asthma, showed the ER with shortness of breath, was determined that the paint exposure was causing an asthma exacerbation, therefore the patient was discharged home, who had an elevated crit, who had a, ended up dying from a large PE after the primary sent them out to get a D-dimer as an outpatient. Right, a number of mistakes that were made along that route, but um, there was a misapplication of a perk rule with somebody who 
who was on hormonal therapy and it just wasn't, right? So both testosterone or estrogens, either hormonal therapy counts because they both have effects. So if their perk rule is negative, then it's no PE, right? So then, like, yeah, you did a Wells and whatever, but you perked, and you perked yourself out of having to do a D-dimer. Okay, right? But otherwise, every other component here is Wells to D-dimer. Moderate, so low and moderate pretest probability is to a D-dimer. And the Wells was helping you interpret what you're doing because you're going to actually use the D-dimer to determine whether or not the patient is going to have imaging ordered, or if you're going to say, nope, this is a negative D-dimer result, they were low to moderate pretest probability, I'm good to discharge without further evaluation and imaging. As opposed to somebody who's high risk, right? So here's the group that you're giving anticoagulation therapy to based on this. And then you're like, okay, I'm going to give treatment and then get imaging. And then based on that imaging, I'm going to either, if they've got poor kidney, if they've got renal dysfunction, they're going to get a VQ scan. If they don't, then they're going to get a CT angio. If they're pregnant, they're going to get a Q scan instead of a VQ scan. Because the American College of Gynecologists is recommending that over the CT scan because the CT scan has higher breast radiation as opposed to the Q scan. And both the Q scan, and even though the Q scan has a higher radiation dose to the baby, it's the amount of millisieverts that are exposed are considered negligible. So it's five times the amount of exposure to the baby that a CT has, because a CT, the, the contrast is iodinated contrast, so your radiation exposure is just the immediate exposure to radiation. And in, in a VQ study, or even a Q study, the millisieverts are five times higher in the in the baby because the contrast is renally, is renally um, eliminated and concentrates in the bladder, and so which happens to be right next to the baby. So the millisieverts are higher in that situation. Um, so I often just have a discussion and say, listen, both are considered negligible. So, and you know, and then I give consideration to what my other differentials are. If I'm thinking this person could have dissection, which is a real thing in pregnant women, then I get the CT scan because then I'm getting more information. Whereas with the Q scan, all I'm getting is perfusion. I won't know if the patient has dissection. So it just varies into where I am on that route with that patient. Um, and so anyway, so those, those are the pathways. But the pathways are not wells and off. There's no wells and, and, and no PE workup. It's a perk and then stop or D-dimer and using the low and moderate wells criteria for that. And that's just where I, with a lot of residents, I've talked to them and they'll, they'll document this. I'm like, no, please don't do that. Like, you have to order D-dimer for your document on well score. So, and then there's no reason to do well score if they're under fifth. Like, you, like in, in my mind, I think we can pretty much perk first, eliminate this whole other half and just put low and moderate down to D-dimer if they're perk positive. And it's a simpler route now, but anyway. Um, another uh, part of their algorithm is positive CT and geography is attained, right? So you've got a positive result, either high probability or uh, CT scan, and then you're risk stratifying based on vital signs. If, if they have a PE, but they're the least severe, they're normal tensive, no RV strain, um, heparin anticoagulation, in clinic or emergency and consider outpatient treatment. So this is the group that can be discharged home. The patients with submassive with RV strain all need to be admitted to hospital um, with a group of these being broken up into those that have evidence of myocardial necrosis, um, episodic hypotension, higher risk category group. Again, the heterogeneity of the worse submassive than the less submassive and consideration of fibrinolytic therapy for this group. Um, and that's all to place 50 milligrams over two hours um, or 25 milligrams to next place or, or half dose of next place for that group. For the group that has a massive PE um, and there's no contraindications, then all to place 100 over two hours is still there, 50, uh, up to 50 milligrams of next place. 
um, and um, and it starts off at 30 milligrams for 60 kilograms, and for every five, for every 10 kilograms, you go up another five milligrams from 30 to, to 50. Anyway, and then persistent hypotension, consider, so despite this treatment, if they're persistently hypotensive, so again, giving, giving a fibrinolytic does not stop you from going to cath lab, and it doesn't stop you from going to the OR. And so with the consideration of uh, open thrombectomy, there's the algorithm there. So the sideway glance I was getting shouldn't have really been too much sideway glance because technically I was really following our own, our own guidelines. Um, the low risk PE patient, this is a group that has a PE severity index score of zero. The S here is the simplified version, meaning that there's no, um, there, there is zero on the score. I'm gonna show that to you in just a moment. Um, Patients whose solid pressure is greater than 90 at all times, um, who have who are compliant, will have follow-up that's assured. All right, this is it, you can just begin them on anticoagulation therapy. You don't have to achieve a certain therapeutic response before discharge. You just start them on treatment. So if it's eloquent, it's 10 milligrams twice a day for a week, and then five milligrams twice a day thereafter. That's the easiest route. At least the easiest one to remember. Um, and, uh, and these are patients who don't have pulmonary hypertension um, on ECG and normal troponin, BNP, and so on and so forth. So it's important that that, that, that initial workup is, is done well. And then you can arrive at the disposition decision to discharge or, or keep based on that. Um, the uh, way to look this up is just to let's see here there, go here, and you can just go to a Pepsi calculator on Google. We'll bring it up an MD calc. And just start clicking away on how old your patient is, and so on and so forth. Um, this is not the simplified version of this, but once you once you've done that, then you hit next results. Um, if you want to do the simple You just type that in MD calc, and is the patient under 80? Great. Do they have history cancer? No. Chronic pulmonary disease, cardiopulmonary disease? No. Heart rate, let's say over 110. That puts them into a high risk group. And if you hit next steps, If you hit next steps, and brings you down here to to advice and management decisions, and so it's only the zeros that you would discharge. So this next step group is a group that you're going to admit and have further workup, formal echocardiogram performed, and so on and so forth. So, but you know, there's that question that comes up of can we discharge somebody with a PE home? Well, yes, if they're a zero on the simplified score, or if you go back to the more robust scoring system of the full PESI instead of the simplified version. So we'll just, we'll put in a guy, our guy here, 70 male. He was already, so let's just, let's just say it was just that and his heart rate was 120. I'm gonna leave everything else alone and hit next steps. And here it is again. Um, if the patient's considered very low risk by this, and then has an overall mortality of severity, considered outpatient management, PE, this patient's not going to fit that. This patient fits into intermediate risk. And so the intermediate risk is going to be admitted, worked up, treated, and so on and so forth. So it helps provide that decision support in a more refined way if you want to use that or the simplified. So all in all, the, um, the only last bit to mention is 
what's in this talk is the data on and on surgical embolectomy. And the data on surgical embolectomy shows that um, that again there's heterogeneous response to this group. There's nothing normal about them, but if they have preoperative cardiac arrest, they're at a significantly increased risk of mortality. But the mortality rates are approaching uh, 40 percent, not 100 percent. So I think it's worthwhile to note that if you're considering a surgical embolectomy, that that the pessimism um, is reasonable in the situation as each you know as, as your judgment relays what's happening to you with that patient. But at the same time, the data shows that in those patients that were taken for surgical embolectomy, um, the overall mortality rate was 26 percent. And when you consider how extreme those responses are, that's a uh, that's a um, that's a pretty big win. Any questions or comments from anybody? Oh, sorry. Let me uh, unmute. Some folks here, just in case. Sorry, Amid, you were muted. I'm trying to unmute you. There we go. Amid, are you there? Yeah, what's that? Did you, sorry. And, sorry, any questions or concerns? I'm sorry, I didn't realize I had you muted before. No, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, no, nothing. Just listening in. Okay. And then I was just going to show the uh, what a McConnell sign looks like on the uh, um, on the ultrasound. So I'll just bring that up here. So you'll see here the, the lateral wall is not really moving, and see how the apex is moving down. So you can imagine somebody jumping up and down it, like on a trampoline. So that sign of the apical movement without uh, free wall movement, and here again you can see the dilated RV as opposed to the LV, and the ratios between the two are, are, are significantly different because you're getting diminished uh, return, and so. Um, and you see this on a four-chamber view. Um, you can you can investigate this further on a two-chamber view of the right ventricle, but those are really to look at the nuances and get the measurements and can, of uh, pulmonary estimations of pulmonary art, um, pulmonary artery pressures <coughs> uh, through velocity through velocity measurements. But using a velocity time integral, you can do that. But it's not something that's standard for any of us to ever be trained in. Uh, but this is for us to do a four-chamber view and then look uh, to see that. So again, not not on a peristonal long axis view, um, but this has a, when you look at that data, there's a high specificity for this uh, of 94%. Sensitivity isn't quite as high, it's about 77%, so it's difficult to, to, which is difficult to change some of these views on patients that are presenting in, in these extremes. But that, that's, that's what you're looking for in echo, is that. So, and I don't think anybody, you, but that term trampoline sign was something that, that was just taught to me when I, when I learned it. But I know it's not, there's nothing official about that. It's really called the McConnell sign. Um, and there are a number of other echocardiographic echo features of pulmonary embolism besides that. But otherwise, there you have it. So 
Um, thank you. If you guys have any other questions or concerns, um, you can always email me, ask me questions whenever we can talk about things. If, if I'm off on something, I always appreciate being told that, hey, you know, I read something else that was different, that was completely opposite of what you just said, and right? Like I actually, as I get as I get um, older, I'm uh, I'm actually more appreciative when somebody disagrees with me than <laughs> when they do agree, right? Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.